Marshall, thanks for that introduction and welcome everyone. On behalf of HSBC and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, <coughs> I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for the second program of our spring series on the global economy. As a leading global bank offering international connectivity to its clients, HSBC has been most pleased to support this important ongoing series at the Chicago Council. In March, we heard remarks from Robert Rubin, former Secretary of the U.S. Treasury and co-chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations, who discussed the economic outlook and policy challenges for the United States and Europe. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome Sri Mulyani Indrawadi, who will discuss the BRICS and middle-income countries as they continue to assume a greater role in the global economy. To sustain the global recovery, the world needs diverse sources of economic growth as Europe struggles with its own unique set of economic challenges and the United States continues only a measured pace to recovery, the Western world has looked increasingly to the emerging markets to produce growth and demand necessary to drive the recovery forward. HSBC has observed for quite some time the underestimated power and potential of these markets. An HSBC report released last year is often cited in the media for the eye-opening findings that indicate by the year 2050, 19 of the world's 30 largest economies will be those currently classified as emerging markets. I'd also like to note some research from the esteemed publication, The Economist, which projects that over the next decade, the emerging world will account for more than 50% of global growth. The magazine has also said the emerging world will account for a disproportionate share of business innovation. This outlook raises many questions I expect to uh, be explored tonight. Here's one. Can the growing economies of the middle-income countries, especially the BRICS, continue to provide a counterbalance to slower economic growth in the West? And how will these countries contribute to the global economy of the future? We're all looking forward to Sri Mulyani Indrawadi's insights on these issues tonight. After her remarks, she'll be joined on stage for an interview and discussion with Marshall, president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Regarding our special guest speaker from the World Bank tonight, Sri Mulyani Indrawadi is Managing Director at the World Bank and is responsible for the bank's operations in all regions. Prior to joining the bank group, she served as the Minister of Finance for Indonesia. Prior to her position as Finance Minister, Ms. Indrawadi led the Indonesian National Development Planning Agency, where she coordinated the government and international reconstruction effort following the devastating 2004 tsunami. Ms. Indrawadi earned a BA from the University of Indonesia and holds a PhD, as Marshall said, from the University of Illinois. She has received numerous honors and awards, including Euro Money Magazine's Global Finance Minister of the Year and Emerging Markets Best Finance Minister in Asia. She also has been regularly on Forbes' list of the 100 most powerful women in the world. Please join me in welcoming Sri Mulyani Indrawadi to the Council. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed, it is really good to be here again, and uh, it's feel like return home for me because of uh, Illinois, because of Chicago, which is close to Urbana Champaign. When I first landed in the United States, it's really in Urbana Champaign, and I think this is like in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and that's why Chicago is always a place for us to have a break. I want to talk about two groups of country today, as I mentioned uh, on introduction, whose growth and performance will radically change uh, the world economy. The first group that the World Bank classify as middle income country, or usually we just call it mix. This is based on their gross national per capita income. This term was coined some 20 years ago based on an income threshold and has been adjusted in dollar terms since then. And if we talk about the middle income country, we are talking about the country with the income per capita between around 1,000 up to 12,000. So it's quite a wide range of income group. And we usually also classify into two groups the low middle income country and high middle country. The threshold is around 
dollar per capita. These middle income countries are quite important to us, the World Bank, and they are shifting more toward being bank shareholder or World Bank shareholder away from the traditional, what we call it, role or uh, place or look position of this middle income country and developing country as just being a borrower or our clients. In 2001, an analyst in Goldman Sachs, Jim O'Neill, coined the term BRICS based on the initial of four large, fast-growing middle income countries. It is Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And since last year, South Africa was invited to join this group, adding an uppercase S to become BRICS. I hope it will be adding with one more I, BRICS, in which Indonesia is there. <laughs> I want to speak of MIG, uh, in which BRICS is actually part of it. Because their growing role in the global economy is becoming now a phenomena, it creates quite a lot of interest from intellectual debate, but also an anxiety in many fronts. And especially when I live here and see the debate here, many of them for the United States is really a new phenomena. Because you are really in the past decade is the only and the one only power in the world. And now recognizing this emerging economy as playing an important part of both policy making process as, as, as well as the debate, it's created quite a lot of reaction, interesting reaction. The world currently is still trying to pull from one of the very severe economic crises, 2008. And if you look at the European today, as well as very early and still debatable recovery of the United States, then all the hopes is actually goes to the emerging country or developing country. China is on its way to becoming the world largest economy soon. Its fellow middle income country also looking to advance in coming years. In recent years, middle income countries have been the engine of global growth. This decade has been a profound shift in growth with the rise of China and India, as well as the growth of many middle income countries. BRIC GDP, in terms of growth, was 8.9% 8 8 in 2010. If you compare with OECD, which is only 2.9%, that's definitely a very big. And BRICS, in this case, is actually consists of around 19% of the global GDP. The MIG, if you enlarge the definition of middle income country, not only BRICS, the rate of growth in 2010 is 7.6%. China, especially, has experienced average growth of, of almost 10% for three decades, driven mainly by investment and export-led growth. Middle-income countries' share of world GDP has gone from only around 18% in the early 2000s to almost now one-third of global GDP. Their share of global trade jumped at the same period from about 19% now to over 30%. There are certainly new opportunities for growing economies. Coming from increased globalization, the growth of emerging economy, new technology, and growing global middle class. This emerging country will contribute of what you call it the new middle class, which is currently is around 1.8 billion. By 2030, estimated will reach 5 billion, two-thirds of them are expected to be in Asia. So today, middle-income countries face both admiration, but actually at the same time, they are also facing new challenges. One can argue that rapidly developing middle-income countries are now victims of their own success. 
With development come new challenges, problems that were not issue for country at lower levels of development now emerge as binding constraint for middle-income country. As middle-income country and BRICS has succeeded in recent years, the issue of development are still very, very real, but they are different. What are the challenges facing middle-income countries? To reach a high income status, BRICS and other mix must address economic, geographic, social transformation, and also equally important, accept the responsibility of their new status. Economically, countries such as my own, Indonesia, will need to move away from agriculture toward labor-intensive growth. But you can see that the dynamic among middle-income countries present a new opportunity. For example, with growth rate as well as wage rate in China rising, many middle-income countries, including Indonesia, could increasingly move into manufacturing. In fact, now China is actually quite systematically moving to many African countries. Also, middle-income countries need to move into higher value-adding manufacturing and services sectors. Just as, for example, Brazil has moved into aeronautical and India into IT sectors. What has been proven to be key in the need is the need to increase productivity. Research underway at the World Bank show that middle-income countries that transform themselves into higher-income country, or we can call it as the middle-income country SKPs, did so in large part by increasing productivity of factor of production, that is land, labor, and capital. For them to be able to increase the productivity, this country must address investment constraints, including regulatory uncertainty, access to capital, employees, and land, and also to address poor infrastructure. They must also further integrate into international commerce. I give you an example, Indonesia artificial fiber. is now sent to China for processing before being re-imported again and used by Indonesian garment manufacturer. Not unsurprisingly, our research showed that middle-income country SKPs have been those with the most open economies. Innovation will be key. Again, China prov provides a good example. Having introduced a range of initiatives in establishing a research and development infrastructure, with their firm increasingly undertaking industry-specific research and development while linking to global network. Many middle-income countries will also have to exploit more of their natural resource. But to capitalize on mineral potential, that require better investment climate and good regulatory as well as enforcement framework. I have my own experience in dealing with Indonesia which have a huge rich natural resource. It's not always actually a guarantee to become a blessing, it could become a curse for a country. Related large countries such as BRICS, they need to think about smart growth, which is in today's world, is actually revert to the green growth. We cannot actually sustain the growth of 30 years of China with 10% growth with the same growth pattern, in which the consumption of energy as well as natural resources will not be sustainable and becoming too polluting. They need to redesign the growth to become low pollution, energy efficient, as well as creating a competitive advantage in a sunrise industry. The second transformation 
challenge for middle-income country is geography. Urbanization has taken off in recent years in almost every middle-income country. In Indonesia, between 1995 and 2005, the urban population grew 55% and there are now multiple urban centers. In China, urban population is foreseen to increase from about one half now to two thirds by 2030. This is by the amount of more than one Tokyo a year. Urbanization brings with its own challenge. Again, I'm using China. The Chinese social and economic inequality largely coming from rural urban differences, especially because of different in access of job, services, as well as social protection. Middle income country must act to reverse this inequality. To further exploit, if not just cope with urbanization, middle income country need to focus on investing in urban infrastructure, including road, water, and sanitation, electricity, and city must be made livable. And actually I visited Chicago today and I heard there are quite a lot of new space. You have the, what do you call it, Millennium Park now? which is actually is very nice to be presented and as an example, I don't know the cost of building that park. <laughs> Could be expensive, but that's, that create the city to become a livable. And many countries, developing countries now really have to focus as a policymaker to design their cities to become a livable. In Indonesia, 80% of 10 million poor urban urbanites has actually lack access to pipe water. So even in a very basic infrastructure access is not there. You can see this as a challenge of middle income country, but I'm sure for many of this business here in Chicago, that sounds like an opportunity. A lot can be over. Now the, the third transition is the social transition in which middle income country experience what you call it a growing middle class. A middle class can help middle income country by, pro by providing a market for sophisticated good. In Brazil, China, and Indonesia, this has actually provided an opportunity for domestic industry to then develop. It can also attract foreign direct, foreign direct investment. Most recently, the Japanese foreign direct investment come to Indonesia is actually aimed to seeking the market opportunity because of a very fast growing middle class. A new middle, middle class can also spur democracy, spending on social services, market liberalization, and better governance. But middle, in, middle class can also a hinder for middle income country growth, especially through what I call it a succession of the successful. This is when new middle class link with the upper class and isolate themselves from the poor. If they rely on private utilities, schools, and hospitals instead of demanding for the public facility they stop identifying with the state and lose interest in reform or good governance. Many of the middle, income, middle class in many middle income countries, I found that they want to have their own private school, their own private hospital. So they're becoming not linked with what you call it public services. An additional challenge to be handled as part of the social transition is sometimes increased inequality and increased vulnerability of people to external shock. And you can see a lot of external shock 
whether it's coming from food, energy, or natural disaster. In fact, this morning in Indonesia, we have another earthquake in the same place of tsunami that is in Aceh. This has meant a lingering class of poor and growing class of near poor who are vulnerable to economic shock or natural disasters. And 70% of the world's poor actually still live in what you call it middle income countries. So although they look so rosy and stealing a lot of headline news, middle income country actually facing with this very challenging task. What this means is that there will be a continued or even more critical imperative for social agenda in all middle income country. That's including BRICS. For the good of this population and for social stability, a social program need to be addressed to help those people to get economic opportunity while deliver services to, uh, while deliver services to them, including important social protection program. Investing in people and institutions is needed to address this transformation, that is economic, geographic, and social transformation. Middle income countries must address issues that hinder education, educational achievement. For most middle income countries, an emerging constraint to grow is actually the skill gap. For the economy to grow into high value added sectors, there is need for better skilled worker whose skill actually match those needs by the market. This country must increase their focus on secondary, tertiary, as well as vocational education for a more sophisticated job market. I can see also in the Middle East and North Africa with this Arab Spring, the most very actually strongest message coming from there is actually job creation, especially for the youth. They are not that not educated. They are educated, but their skill is mismatched with the market. So in many countries, also including Indonesia, the issue is not just increasing the access to education, but ensuring access to a high quality education that is relevant to the need of the economy. You may also have read this week on the news that Brazil President Dilma Rousseff visiting Washington, stressing science education and training as the number one priority for her government. Needed institutional enhancement include functional public financial management system so that state or the role of state or the function of state is more accountable. Middle income countries need strong civil service structures. They need a civil service structure that is accountable and they also need to have an effective, accountable local government which should lead to a better service delivery and regional development. I've been dealing in really reforming civil servants in Indonesia for more than five years. This is actually the hardest development challenge. You can plan and maybe easily can see, visibly see the progress when you build a road, you build irrigation, airport, or seaport. But building institution, especially bureaucracy, is maybe the hardest. You really need to have a good design, but really building institution need a lot of what you call trial and error. Most of the countries, the developing country, need to further strengthen institution that oversee maintenance of the rule of law, judicial system to sustain the anti-corruption effort. I will share you a little bit story of Indonesia when I was finance minister. 
I took the office and asked myself, what can I do in the five years of my time serving this government? Now becoming finance minister of the country which is associated or has the reputation as the, among the most corrupt in the world. And you don't want to be corrupt and you want to clean up the institution. So you start cleaning up the tax offices as well as the custom. That is the, mo the two most corrupt in Indonesia, seen by both business community people. But when you try and you start cleaning up these two offices, many of those cases now has been shifted to the court. And Minister of Finance cannot reform the court system, of course. So although you try to clean up your own institution, you really need another institution that also need equally effective and at least equally clean. And this is the challenge which is faced by many, many, many countries in the world. And especially for many developing countries, this problem is becoming even more. Some middle income countries need, uh, need to still shift toward a more market-based economy. This is one of the messages when we have a joint study with the Chinese authority to have what we call it the China 2030. The challenge of the China economy to sustain their progress now is how they can complete to the transform their economy into a more market-based economy. And then it will be seen as more or less direct role of the state. Interestingly, this discussion is now becoming very, very uh, high profile because many countries, developing countries, see the China as one of the model when you talk about South-South cooperation. And with this China model, the role of state is definitely very, very important. So emerging countries are now seen as a critical force of global economic development. The World Bank predicts that by 2025, Brazil, China, India, Indonesia, South Korea, Russia will account for more than half of global growth. The significance of middle income country and BRICS in global economy is exemplified by China. It is now the world's second largest economy and also is the largest exporter. Its foreign reserves are the highest in the world, and it provides the largest source of sovereign debt financing for both United States and Europe. In fact, I was in China, Beijing, a month ago, and Christine Largard was there. We were asked to give a speech uh, on a lunch session, and one of the questions is get, if China now asks to become less saving society and more consumer-driven economy. So who's going to lend to the United States? It was a quite complicated question for Christine Lagarde at that time. So when I, I was asked to answer that question, I said, well, you know, when you ask China to rebalance themselves, the other side of the coin, the United States, to also need to rebalance yourself. So you have to less borrow in this case. But we see that actually since 2008, when we see the financial crisis back then, it was really China's stimulus package that mitigate the global effect of the recent economic recession. They are so effective and the magnitude of their stimulus package is just amazing. So it is important for this country, especially middle income country and BRIC, to accept the responsibility of their new status by playing a more proactive role internationally. If you follow the debate globally, many middle income countries usually use the rhetoric of saying that we are the victim of this globalization this is the advanced country. We are become just the recipient of many of what you call it, the global norm, global policy, global rule. But it's time for now, many middle income countries have to play 
a more active role in actively shaping the global norm. You can see it in a climate change negotiation. You can see when the discussion about the new financial regulation post 2008 financial crisis. And in many areas of what you call it development, this developing country and middle income country provide not only a knowledge and lesson, but they also play quite an important role. But I see this is still on a, what you call it, sporadic. It's not organized. Advanced country, OECD country, you have G8, although now G8 is not that popular, but at least you have this forum. You have the share value, you have the share mechanism in which you can play as a group. But when you talk about the BRICS, they have actually need to define what is the share value. Even now, I think last two weeks, when the headline news saying that they want to establish their bank, the BRIC bank. I'm sure it's good in rhetoric, but when you try to translate those idea or goal into reality, they will discuss about who should pay what, what governance, how you are going to land, what policy, what value, what kind of principle that will govern them. That is going to be a long and quite interesting and intense debate even among the BRICS or middle income country. So for middle income country to be able to play their constructive role globally because they recognize the rise of their role, the role of this middle income country becoming more important is because they also get the benefit of globalization. Now they have to shape, to shape this global economy so that it can continue to provide the advantage for not only the middle-income country, but most importantly, for the other fellow low-income country, and even we call it in a bank, fragile, and conflict state. At the World Bank, we are recognizing that even when it comes to knowledge exchange, much of experience in tackling the problem of poverty it actually lies in the emerging market. This country can provide a lot of knowledge in a development issue. So middle income country and BRICS face a changing world. And there are steps that they need to take to move up the economic ladder. I have seen Indonesia and other countries take this step with great success. And I believe that that success can be duplicated elsewhere. Having been a finance minister in Indonesia, and now I'm serving as managing director of the World Bank, I believe that strong leadership and good policy making make it possible to navigate these challenges. But the most important significant effort need to be devoted to build human and institutional capacity capable people and strong institution are the key to making nation great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shumulyani. Um, for those of you who don't know Indonesian customs, I, I, I want you to know I'm not being disrespectful to the minister and speaking to her as her first name, uh, Sri Mulyani, with the appropriate uh, honorific title. Uh, that is the custom in Indonesia, as I'm sure many of you in the audience know. Uh, thank you very much. That was a, a remarkable overview of, of middle income countries in general and, and the BRICS in particular. Fascinating. Um, I, and I want to come back to it, but I'd like to, I'd like to begin by asking you to step back and give us your assessment of, of where we are in the global recovery. Taking into account uh, the mix and the BRICS, understanding that they too are having some difficulties. Uh, India's growth has slowed sharply. Uh, China is predicting a slowing of growth. And of course, we know what's happening in, in North America and Europe. So, can you 
give us your assessment of where are we along this path? Are we still, uh, are, we, are we recovering or are we just teetering on some edge still? Well, Mark, so, uh, if you look at the crisis back in 2008, 2009, that was when the contraction global economy almost everywhere, it's only a few countries, China, India, Indonesia has a positive growth, but almost all countries have been visited, Latin America, Asia, the other ASEAN country, Africa, they are all suffering from this negative growth. So it was a very depressing time back in 2009. So when you see the concerted effort by leaders, especially uh, on the forum of G20, they by design and very coordinated try to do the counter-cyclical policy. All of them, regardless their situation of their domestic economy. Whether this is through the fiscal stimulus or to the relaxing the monetary policy. And that was very remarkable in terms of the result. 2010, you see a lot of countries rebound, even double-digit growth. That creates a lot of false optimism, as if mm. the situation is already solved. In fact, the one which is solved is just the recovery because you come from a very deep contraction into a recovery. But the structural problem, whether in a financial institution, public debt, especially the uh, 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 public uh, uh, debt in an uh, advanced country, has not been solved yet. And that's now coming up again in 2011, especially on the last part, and continue in 2012. Because then, the real issue about how you are going to deal with this country exposed by such a huge debt in Europe, how you are going to deal and fix the financial sector, many of them has been actually uh, supported life supported, if you can call it that way, or supported through a very generous liquidity expansion by both central bank here as well as in Europe. But that's not the real life. This is just the life in which you are not really based on a strong, healthy balance sheet. So when you ask about where the recovery, we are recovering, but it's still in a very weak position because the fragile recovery it's always have the downside risk of this structural problem. If you learn from Indonesian 97, 98 financial crisis, we suffer almost like 1% growth for five years. It was a very painful recovery. We have a combination of deleveraging, you have the public debt which is increasing very dramatically because of the financial bailout. And then you also have political transition. That make all the complication. That's exactly what is the episode now in Europe. So at some point, we were lucky at that time because the global economy, the rest of the world was healthy. So they can pull us because then we can expand our export. And that's make the recovery faster. Now it's becoming very complicated because that's why they ask, who's going to pull Europe out from the external demand? And that's why they look at China, Asia, Latin America to become the source of growth by making them competitive and exporting their commodity there. Or within Europe, they see German as the source of the market to pull other European. So in this case, yes, we are recovering from 2008-2009 financial crisis. There is a correction in 2011 this is just to remind that the structural problem needs to be addressed. And in order to address this, that structural problem, it will take time. Some painful step is going to cost a little bit longer of all what you call it, the adjustment. Can I follow up on that? You, you spoke at some length in your talk about the, the uh, transitions that middle income countries will now have to go through. Um, I think you were speaking both in, in medium term and longer term terms. My question is, will the, will the shift in the emerging markets from export-led, investment-led growth to greater consumption, um, greater focus on the domestic market be rapid enough to help Europe, and for that matter, over time, the United States, to renew whatever normal levels of growth uh, that, that must occur? I, and if not, 
What's the downside option, the really worst case option? Do you, do you worry about the kind of sustained distress in the Western economies that will lead to protectionism? Uh, is that still a worry or is that really receded into the far distance? Well, first of the speed of what you call it rebalancing. Certainly for a country whose, whether their DNA, their growth model was based on export investment uh, factors, change into consumption is not going to change overnight. I mean, in China, it really has something to do with a lot of very fundamental policy revolve whether this is related to the social safety net, that is the access for especially family or poor family for the, for the health and education, no matter where they are, because many of the labor is coming from the rural uh, eastern part to the, uh, to the coastal part in this case. They don't have the access to these social services, and that need to be reformed. They call it hukou system, which is need to be more portable. The second one is also in terms of their health as, as well as pension policy. That will create more the security for the family so that they say that, okay, now I can use part of my income to spend. If they don't feel that they are secure when I'm old, and don't forget that China is also facing with this demographic challenge. They are growing old. They are becoming older become before they become too rich. Mm -hmm. So they really need to think about when I'm old and I only have one child, I really have to save myself. The government will not provide me with enough security of their future. So their instinct cannot be changed. So you're right in this case that the speed of changing the development growth model into more domestic-based, consumption-based, that will require quite a lot of fundamental issue, not to mention the fiscal implication of all this policy to the China economy. It will require time. And that's why the immediate, what you call it, the demand coming from this country is, no, is not going to be strong enough and mass. So what we are going to expect? Well, we are talking about the new normal now. If we are talking always that the normal growth is just like before the crisis, the China is 10%, Middle income country is around seven to eight percent. Developed countries are for four to five percent. That was the normal before the crisis. The new normal, the China is now talking about six to seven percent. Many middle income countries now lowering their growth five percent. And OECD or the advanced countries now talking about two or three percent. Or who is will be enough? Actually, it will be good enough for many of the European countries at this moment, I guess. But that is going to be like something before then you are going to see the new structure of the economy with a healthier balance sheet. Innovation will be then stimulated again. And then you are going to have a new, what you call it, a, another level of normal that is higher than that. But before that, we are going to stuck with this one maybe in the five years. Or for Indonesia and many of the Latin America suffering from the crisis, it could take a decade sometimes. Did you all take that on board. Um, but your second question about protectionism. Yes, please, I was uh, going to ask you about that. Well, I mean, the instinct of many countries when they are becoming weak is always then they become protected. This is not only happened in low-income country, middle-income country, high-income country. So it's amazingly, it's also happened everywhere. And that's why the protectionism instinct, especially when it is come to the election or public opinion is, is always there. Because globalization is always create also a loser. And those who are losing from this globalization is not really feel that they are compensated or it's worth. They don't see the, what you call it, the aggregate advantage or benefit of this globalization. Well, if you look at the global or regional, you see that the globalization is provide quite a lot of benefit. Whether you talk about poverty reduction, you talk about the prosperity, and even in this case, the innovation and technology. So now the challenge is for many policymakers is actually how you can still keep using the language and giving a message to many of your people that this benefit of globalization by opening up and creating a benefit of trade and exchange can be seen as a real benefit that enjoyed by 
as much people, maybe not all people, but as much people as possible. That will prevent, or in this case, check the trend of protectionism. But I will not underestimate that. I know when I was finance minister, it was very tough <coughs> because many of the people is always asking to reverse this, what you call it, openness. Well, actually, when you talk about the modern economy or modern sector who actually grow very healthy and strong is always the one which is open and competitive. Uh, let me ask about another potential constraint on growth and recovery, and that is uh, commodities. Hmm. Uh, we've already seen in the United States that the, the rising price of gas, of petrol, of petroleum, is being seen as a potential risk to our recovery, our anemic recovery at this stage. Mm. I know in, in India and China and Indonesia, the governments are under enormous pressure to, uh, to prevent, uh, to not have the population feel that impact because it's so politically difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, this problem extends to other commodities as well. But could you talk about over the next, or the medium term, uh, resource constraints as a, as a pro possible problem. Every, just as we get growing again, the rising price of commodities is going to knock us back? Well, um, if we talk about the middle class, which is projected to reach 5 billion by 2030, this new middle class, and now three quarters is in Asia, they are going to consume more the refrigerator, air condition, car, so you can imagine that the demand for natural resource is not going down. Except maybe if the technology and the efficiency of the design of those. And that's why within this China 20 study with China, they are discussing about redesigning a more greener, less, less consumption of the energy in each of the one percentage growth that they make. They use less energy. They have to pollute less. That is the green growth model. But even the, this technology advancement maybe is create a progress, but you cannot beat the fact that the magnitude is going to be there. That is the scale of this middle class demand is going to be there. And that's why the commodity price and natural resource is going to be a constant phenomenon. It's a bit anomaly when you are discussing and combining with this weakening or recession in wheat. Because in the past, you see that this natural resource boom or high price is actually driven by this very strong demand because of very high healthy growth globally. But it's going to be stay there. Now, what is the policy response and challenge? Many countries, including developing middle income country, low income country, actually is very rich natural resource. Africa is definitely one of this example. What we can say as the lucky situation now is that they can learn how to manage another natural resource boom if they want to learn. Whether this is on a policy response, institutional strengthening, policy framework that will then benefiting as well as managing this benefit of natural resource boom for their growth as well as prosperity poverty reduction. For many countries, which is really the demand or the consumer of this natural resource, that is going to be more complicated. And Indonesia is one of the case because we are always seen as the oil and natural gas producer. But because the growth is very now strong, the demand for their own domestic is becoming even larger. No, Indonesia now become the net importer rather than the exporter. And that's complicated, the policy maker, because people always think that oil and gas is our own oil and gas. Why we should pay high price? So, but other countries, which is not having the luxury of that, it's going to be even more complicated. So growth, as well as development issue, is becoming more complicated when we are talking about whether the demographic composition, when you are talking about the middle class, whether you are talking about the size. Many of them, the answer of the problem is of course technology, innovation, a different growth model. But this can only be provided or delivered if the policymaker recognize that in order for the innovation, technology, 
to answer this kind of problem. They need a totally, totally different, what you call it, policy framework. Um, what is the role of the World Bank in a rapidly transforming global economy? Where the once poorest countries are now middle income and fast rising countries, where the once almost entirely rich countries of Europe are now, some of them are experiencing great distress. 50% um, unemployment among young men in Spain, for instance, and so forth. Should the bank be rethinking its mission? Should the bank be lending to the southern European countries? Should the bank be shutting down its lending and support for the middle income countries and giving more to the mo lowest income countries in sub-Saharan Africa? Is there any discussion about this in the institute? Oh, yeah, that's our everyday discussion. <laughs> because as a multilateral institution, the bank is also questioning and uh, constantly asking our own role, especially recognizing the changing environment. First, if, if even we are only just concentrating what we call it the traditional client of the bank, we classify into now three different categories, fragile and conflict state, the low income country, and the middle income country. Africa, sub-Sahara, we have 18 countries classified as fragile and conflict state. The issue of development is so, so complicated because you are dealing with a failed state, weak or almost non-existent, lack of security. So even on what you call it, the basic necessary role of the government is not there. So we, we really need to have what you call it hands-on. And sometimes even in the bank, we discuss whether the policy, operational policy that we have, which usually we are dealing with a normal developing country, need to be modified in a much more simple way. I mean, I'm talking, for example, about procurement. The bank is always asking the procurement need to be at least three bidders, open competitive. Who's going to compete in a fragile state? Sometimes you only deal with only one supplier. So that kind of thing is really, really, I mean, but you are really talking about humanitarian issue, the real development challenge. Low income country, many of them is really progressing well. And that's, some of them is really enjoying the boom of natural resource. Some of them now really looking at their neighbor or they look at the China model. They look at, so there are so many developing country which inspire them. And that's really have a positive impact, uh, in, uh, influence to policy maker in many low income country. But still the issue of the capacity of the institution, po poverty, basic infrastructure is there. Middle income country is the discussion that we are having this evening. Many of them seen that as if China has no development problem at all. In fact, China is still borrowing the bank. They borrow us maybe only around one billion, one and a half billion out of their reserve, which is three trillions. You will ask what for? It's actually for both sides, the bank as well as the China, to learn. The China always asking bank to come to the remote, very difficult, very poor area whether this is on irrigation, whether we are talking about road. And that is what they are very smart of using the bank. If they are the bank successful in managing, in delivering the development project, they will repeat it to the many other area. India, you're talking India is now is powerful, big, and it's always become a very positive headline. But you also see that they are still having 300 million poor people there, live in India. They are asking us to deal with this very difficult poor province. Because they want to know whether the bank can bring them not money, but knowledge. We sometimes lend them with 500 million, they come up with their own budget, 5 billion. But they want to make sure that this 5 billion can be used properly in order to address the poverty. But if India can solve their poverty, it will be good for the global economy. So in a way, the bank is really now have to design, and it's not become irrelevant, but we, it's become even relevant, but in a more challenging and different environment. Now, for the Europe, I think, well, they can learn each other. I mean, this is a country which is already have a very long history, have the capacity. 
I think what is more complicated is more on the political side and the choices. But just remember that many countries have been through this kind of crisis. They've been through all those difficult choices also. So I think it's not about what to learn, where to learn, but actually how they are going to implement that lesson. My final question, I don't mean to put you on the spot, you can duck this if you'd like. Do you have a candidate to succeed, Mr. Zellick? Well, the management should not have a candidate. The one who gave a candidate is the shareholder. As you know, your president is putting one candidate there, and United States is the biggest shareholder, of course. So, you can see. <laughs> You can see why she's so good, ladies and gentlemen. Right? <laughs> uh, open to all of you. Um, Did you all hear the question? Population growth in Indonesia? Yes. Yeah. We are, I think we are now reached 220 or 200, almost 30 million. Still going, uh, what is the growth rate of the population? I'm not remember. Is it around 2% now? But Indonesia, according to the projection of the family composition of the age and so on, fertility, we are going to still, what you call it, enjoy the demograph demographic dividend until 2025. That is when the growth of the young age is still much or bigger than the growing of the older age. So after 2025, Indonesia is going to suffer with the other society, which is older society. And that's why many developing countries still have what you call it, this demographic dividend. But it is going to be narrowing down. If you look globally, that means that the supply of new labor can only come from this young demographic nation. Yes, Adele. Thank you very much. Um, I've just returned from Brazil with 20 members of Congress. Mm. One of them said, we left Brazil alone. We paid, didn't pay attention to it for 10 years. Now we need to go and learn. Mm -hmm. um, they've reduced poverty by half, 30 million, increased the middle class, strengthened the economy of the impoverished Northeast, mainly through explicit transfers of funds to families. I'm interested in your view about the various strategies for dealing with poverty and increasing the middle class. Is this kind of government transfer the model you prefer? There are others who say leave things alone and increase wealth and it will happen naturally. How would, if you were uh, in charge of these countries, um, manage the, uh, <laughs> uh, the issue relating to poverty and the growth of the middle class? Okay. I'm glad you asked that question, but I will pretend that this is not have, sub, have nothing to do with the United States politics as well. <laughs> but social safety net is actually a very important on many of the poor or low-income and middle-income countries. Many countries can really design their growth in a more equitable and inclusive way when they co provide this, what you call it, the social safety net. The form of social safety net can be different. In Mexico, you call it opportunidades. In Brazil, you call it bolsa familia. In Indonesia, we call it uh, program, kecamatan development program. This is the idea when the state has been seen as weak. And in my speech, I also say that the local government capacity is still weak. You cannot really rely them to deliver service. And that's why, in order to circumvent that one, you give direct transfer to them, to the, to the poor family, the direct cash transfer. That happened, but that will not solve the problem unless the service provider will also be built. And that's why it should be a simultaneous for Bolsa Familia or the opportunities. You will receive cash money but you have to prove that you send your children to school. You will receive money if you prove that your baby is going to be immunized by a certain date. This is a very basic for many of you in a developed country like the United States, something that it's supposed to be responsibility of you, your individual. But in many poor families, they're either too poor 
to care about their children. And then you are going to have all this vicious circle. Poor family have a poor children. Their poor children cannot become escaped from this poverty. So cutting this vicious circle is very important. Of course, for a country which is much advanced, in which individual capacity choices is there, you have a choices about what kind of education, health services, or basic infrastructure like clean water. But for many poor family or poor country, they don't have the choices. And that's why it's really a different design. But social safety nets now become one of the program in which the bank pro promoted or supported to many of our client country. Because we see this is not only addressing the issue of inequality, but also very, very effective in protecting the poor, especially when facing with the shock of commodity shock, food price, that actually is very good uh, to have this social safety net. And that's why that has become one of the priority that we have. Yes, uh, gentleman in the back, please. Yes, right here with the white jacket, please, Josh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ahmed Samman, I am from Egypt. Mike, thank you so much for Chicago Council for this opportunity to be with you. And my question is, uh, I work closely with the World Bank in Egypt, and I know in how is World Bank has been designed in the United States. Uh, for that... Uh, Could you hold the mic to your mouth, please? Okay. okay. Uh, for, for that, I am looking forward that uh, uh, World Bank stop uh, supporting the government in, in developing countries. Because if you're supporting many... Uh, government that will be created a new corruption and we see it every 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 uh, uh, at, uh, at every region uh, from the uh, Middle East or, uh, or Latina that they, they are not uh, going well with with the democracy you see that uh, if you giving many support for the every government that allow for more corruption so you should looking for uh, another way to making development in these countries by working with NGOs, working with the private sector, working and found another ways because that will allow make that's making a real development in these countries. Thank yeah. you so much. You want to comment on that corruption? And well, yeah, I think that is a very important issue. Um, we definitely, I mean, the bank on the article of agreement mandating us to work with and through the government because the shareholder is the government, 187 countries, and the client is government. In the past, when it is combined with the non-democratic, non-openness, non-accountable, transparent environment, you're right, it can create and become the very effective recipe of governance problem or corruption. That was happening in Indonesia. This is despite the President Suharto was very successful in reducing poverty, but corruption is everywhere and become the issue. So now we are facing with this environment which is much different. With the combination of the information technology, social media, people connected, get the information <coughs> much faster, much efficient. It cannot be censored in a way. So that creates an openness, transparency become mandatory. And that's what the World Bank is also adopting. We actually become one of the most open and transparent institutions. Among the multilateral institutions, we are even uh, get the highest rank on that. We also have to rethink about our business model. Sure that our client is still the government, but it doesn't prevent us to get engaged directly with the civil society. When you talk about the governance, while you are working on the government side, by building the institution, providing with a good framework, adopting or asking them to adopt, or they are, they are building and designing the transparency on their budget. In fact, the bank will not lend to any country on a budget support unless their budget is become transparent and open. Don't forget that many countries actually not opening, not always opening their budget to the public. Tunisia is actually adopting after this resolution. And that is something which is actually one step, the first step toward a good governance. It doesn't give you a guarantee it will not having any corruption after openness, but at least that's opening up for any prevention. 
in order for this openness becoming an effective force to build a good governance, you need the civil society, a strong civil society. And that's why now working in strengthening the demand for good governance by strengthening the civil society, they become literate on the budget, they know how much money spend for what, that's become a very critical. And that is something which is actually takes, uh, as I said, institutional building, it takes some time. It takes time to get what you call it, the balancing factors. So I think this is the area which the bank recognized. We, the President Zulik mentioned in the speech, this is what you call it, the democratizing development. You are op op opening up, not on our own operation, but also in terms of the way we engage with the government is a totally, totally different from what we have done back in the 1970s, 80s, or 90s. Uh, we have time for one more question, and uh, gentleman right here, please. Yeah. Is that Anthony? Yes. Sir. Yes. Hi. Hi, Marsha. Um, hi. Um, I just had a, a question. I was wondering about one of the issues that hasn't been brought up is the issue of food security. And you make the case for uh, mid-market countries um, developing sort of a value-added manufacturing and consumption model, but as the world population grows, food security is going to be uh, an essential issue, mm -hmm. and these would necessarily become uh, lower producers of agricultural goods. So how do you sort of balance those, um, those competing interests? Well, moving Did you all hear the question about agriculture and food security? Moving from the agriculture to the manufacturing labor intensive, it doesn't mean that the, the production and productivity of the agriculture is becoming less. In fact, this is the challenging, the most important challenge for development for us globally. And you, you are right, you, you raised the issue of food security. In the past 50 years, or since 1970, the investment, the real term investment in agriculture is actually declined by 50%. And you can see that the productivity of farmer in many developing countries is now even lower if you compare with the three decades before. And that's if you combine with the number of population is even growing, then you have this kind of problem. So yes, food security has become the highest now among the highest priority for the bank. We work together with many, I think USAID, uh, United States provide, many of the advanced countries provide this food security support for many developing countries. I think addressing this issue in many fronts, from the supply side, meaning that research, technology, investment on that, that will then create more a better seed, better productivity. Agricultural infrastructure is actually very, very lagged behind. Many in irrigation or land has been converted into an urban area. As I said, urbanization has happened everywhere. Even in, in Indonesia, it is predicted by 2025, the whole Java Island has become city. And that is actually the place for the rice grower. So we are asking about where we are going to get rice. Maybe Myanmar now is becoming the export of rice, which is very, very big. Also Vietnam, Thailand. But they are also having their urbanization problem. So everywhere has become the problem of converting life. But irrigation as well as preserving the land, but the productivity of each hectare of land, in this case, is becoming very important. But also, the last thing is on uh, information. Sometimes by providing a better weather forecast, for you, I don't know, well, Chicago is a windy city, I don't know, in the morning you can have, <laughs> you cannot predict weather maybe easily here. But for many farmers, even in Africa and so on, to have a much accurate weather forecast has really helped them a lot in planning their uh, for, the, for their agriculture activity, in planting seed and so on. So at this factor, another information is about price. <coughs> because many of actually overshooting down and up is because of the speculation or insecurity. You don't know where the stock. Sometimes it's also related to the logistical problem. The food is there, but it's not in the place which is needed. And that's create what you call overshooting of price. So we are going to attack, and that's required quite a lot of many players. Definitely government is important, role of the government, but private sector, small farmer, is becoming part of the solution. You cannot just address this food security of attacking with the big company. 
because many of the 50% of the world population in developing countries really live in agri agriculture sector. Well, I, I want first to thank Sri Mulyani for coming to Chicago and, and for sharing this evening with us and for being the latest and wonderful addition to our HSBC series. Thank you, David. Um, thanks to all of your colleagues. Uh, and, and, and I want to say to Sri Mulyani that whoever becomes Mr. Zelik's successor will be fortunate to have you as a colleague. Thank you very much, ladies thank and gentlemen. You, Please thank, thank you very much. Thank you.